Good day to all of you, wherever you are. I know some of you are very, very far away, but uh, I thank you very much for taking the time to join this panel discussion today. And we all know why we are here today, because the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, came into our life about uh, roughly six months ago, and the disease, COVID-19, and it's playing havoc ever since with our social life, our health, our economy, and uh, no one is spared, frankly, rich or poor. So we are really affected by this and we are united in our effort to find solutions how to prevent this disease from going wild and causing more havoc in people's lives. So as this is a new virus, naturally we don't have any vaccine. And as this is a new disease, we don't also have any drugs specifically targeted to disease. But there is a lot of effort ongoing based on the existing scientific knowledge, whether we can use some of the drugs that are already existing that have been invented for other purposes to test them against coronavirus and in the COVID-19 context, because we know now some of the mechanisms of virus infection, how the virus is affecting the disease. So we have reasons to believe that some of the existing molecules will be very effective. So as the panel discussion is novel drugs, but some of you may wonder, some of these drugs are advanced in the phase two clinical trials, but they are still novel in this context of addressing the COVID-19 disease. So from that perspective, all efforts are worthwhile and noble, and we hope to have some success very soon whether it is through vaccine, as well as in treating the people where vaccine is not effective with the other drugs. So with that introduction, I'll introduce you right away the uh, format and the panel members. Can I have the first slide, Thomas? So the title of the forum is Powering Early Stage Innovation. And what the subtopic is the potential therapeutic strategies to prevent and conquer COVID-19. And uh, myself and Vincent, we are going to chair this uh, session. And uh, the panelists are, as you know, uh, there are five members. And in the order of their speaking, they are shown in the next slide. Thomas, can we please go to the next slide? Yeah. So the panel speakers, for the sake of uh, simplicity, we move from biological to small molecules. And uh, the list of the speakers is, uh, I have sent you before in that order. Uh, Dr. Penninger from uh, Vancouver, Christoph Esslinger from Memo, Hella Hilhoff from Immunic, and uh, Mr. Dr. Ali Jackson from Bergen Bio, Akil Jackson from Bergen Bio, and um, Gilead Rade from Red Hill Bio. So the format is next slide, please. Yeah, that is, as I said, we are going to discuss two biological and four small molecules. And the next slide, please. And that's the end of it. So I will start with Dr. Penninger because he had another meeting today and uh, for the next half an hour, I think he will be available to us. And uh, I just want to introduce uh, Dr. Penninger quickly saying that he is one of the first people who actually invented a therapeutic even before the virus exists. So in the next five minutes, he will tell us his story. Joseph, can you please continue? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, ple great pleasure to meet you. Uh, hello from Vancouver. So, so I'm sitting here in my isolation in Vancouver. <clears throat> um, just in five minutes, uh, what we have been doing and how I got uh, drawn into COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so many years ago, actually 22 years ago, uh, I co-discovered, I'm actually a genetic engineer, so I tried to figure out what genes do and understand them and then basically see how we can make new medicines based on this. So many years ago, I actually co-discovered a molecule called ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme number two. So we did not publish the first sequence. We had the sequence in our fridges, but as a genetic engineer, we made the first mutant animals. So we engineered mice, which lacked ACE2. And to make the story short, <clears throat> uh, it turns out ACE2 uh, is the negative regulator in a system we call the Iranian angiotensin system. So it, it uh, inactivates a little peptide, which we called H2, angiotensin 2. 
And this peptide can drive many diseases, heart disease, kidney disease, uh, heart failure, it regulates our blood pressure. So there was a, a large literature out there. And it turned out based on our research that ACE2 is basically the good guy in the system and it inactivates the system. And by doing so, it protects multiple tissues. It protects against hypertension, against heart failure, against kidney injury, uh, liver injury, <clears throat> uh, you name it. So, so I was basically Mr. ACE2 uh, 10 years ago, and we mapped all these functions uh, in the system. Uh, next slide, please. And then, then it became really interesting because ACE2 turned out to be the entry gate for the SARS virus. <clears throat> so very early on, actually 15 years ago, uh, we had the first paper showing that ACE2 is the essential uh, receptor, the essential entry gate in the living organism for the SARS coronavirus. No ACE2, no infection. And the reason why the SARS coronavirus actually became a killer virus was is because ACE2 protects our tissues from multiple tissue injury. And uh, this we had mapped out and could explain why this virus is actually, and the SARS virus caused the lung failure and lung disease. And then COVID-19 came about. And COVID-19, the virus which causes COVID-19 is very close to the first SARS virus and also uses ACE2 as an entry gate. So basically our research we did 15 years ago became now the center stage and probably ACE2 has become the most researched protein on the planet for the last two, three months. And it became the center stage of COVID-19 research. Probably half of all drug development is centering on ACE2 and how it uh, binds to the spike protein of the virus. ACE2 can also explain how we get infected because it sits in the nose, it sits deep in the lungs. That's why people get this deep uh, pneumonia, lung inflammation. ACE2 sits on blood vessels. So later COVID-19 is also a blood vessel disease. ACE2 sits in the heart, in the kidney, in the brain. So we can explain this ACE2 infection. It's the essential entry gate. And we can also explain how the virus spreads, how it gets from the nose into the lung and in multiple tissues. <clears throat> the next slide, please. Uh, also, what we did before on ACE2 and, and figuring out its function, and of course, ACE2 being the essential receptor for the virus which causes COVID-19, we had developed already a soluble version of ACE2, <clears throat> uh, basically as an enzyme replacement therapy for lung disease and lung failure. This molecule went already into 89 humans in phase one and phase two clinical trials and is now in Europe, and want to expand to the US and also into Russia, in this phase 2B <clears throat> placebo controlled double blinded study, severe COVID 19 patients. The reason why we do this is because we have actually two therapeutic functions engineered in one molecule. The first reason is it's probably the best neutralizing antibody you can find. It's the natural receptor, it has very high affinity, like a super high affinity antibody. Uh, and we just recently showed in a paper in Cell that it reduces the virus load by a factor of 1,000 to 5,000 times. So it's at least as good, probably even better than Remdesivir. And the second function is it actually protects against multiple organ damage because of its function as an enzyme. So, uh, and with this, uh, 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 this is uh, being developed at the company in in Europe called Apiron Biologics. Uh, also, I started a new company where we have new technology to figure out uh, the weakness and the weak spots in the Achilles heels of viruses, the COVID causing virus, but many other viruses like swine fever virus, uh, flu viruses, you call it. And we just recently, it will be announced soon, we actually the, the only really innovative drug development uh, network in Europe which will get now significant funding by the European Union, <clears throat> validating our technology that we have can really go for new viruses, find the Achilles heels, and basically develop and hopefully develop drugs for the future so that COVID-19 does not happen anymore. So thanks to you for listening and giving me a chance to present our work. Thank you, Joseph. We'll come back to some of those topics that you have raised during the Q&A. 
and we'll continue the introduction of the topics with Dr. Uh, Christoph Esslinger. Next uh, slide, Thomas. Yeah. So, good afternoon, everybody. So we are one of these representatives who do make antibodies against uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. So the rationale behind this is that we are a company that has developed a platform that is able to derive antibodies from the repertoires of human donors by doing single cell RT-PCR and the speciality of using single cell technologies that we keep heavy and light chain in a cognate fashion. I must apologize. I have a bit of hoarse voice. I, it's not COVID. I think I got it from my daughter. So it's some nasty bacterial bug, but I think we'll get through it. So we have a technology that is able to cover um, capture 80% of incoming B cells and translates these via a single cell technology into uh, hex cells that express the cognate antibody. And we applied this technology in the first viral target on a BK polyoma virus, which is a different story. But we were just closing in on, 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 on shuffling the whole program of the polyoma virus into GMP production when uh, SARS CoV 2 arrived on the horizon and we embarked on the project, enrolled the first patients uh, or donors from Switzerland, which were volunteering to give blood, who overcame um, COVID-19, gave, uh, gave blood, and we were able to derive antibodies from these. So the idea is that we use the clinically selected survivor of the disease, if, if it's the one, so one, we do our technology, we derive virus neutralizing antibodies, we select the best antibodies by in vitro and in vivo studies, and the idea is then to produce a recombinant antibody for immunotherapy of COVID-19 in patients. And I think uh, the, the most important thing is mentioned on the next slide, we have to be fast. So can you put the next slide, please? So this is our plan to move rapidly with an antibody drug into the clinic. So we started, as I said, with the first donor coming in at uh, April 2nd this year. Um, we performed antibody discovery. After six weeks, we have found the first neutralizing antibodies. During the course of this program, we have now also shortened our development timelines to three weeks. Uh, antibody discovery coming from patient in our ward until we get a monoclonal antibody in recombinant format that neutralizes the virus. Um, antibody discovery is, is one thing, but also the a severe bottleneck could have been the GMP, GMP production of antibodies that usually takes about uh, 18 months. Um, so we could shorten these timelines to 3.5, uh, working together with our regulatory experts and also with the CDMO who is willing to embark on this uh, venture. And we plan to come into the clinic uh, as soon as of fall this year. So in November, December, we plan to uh, do our phase one and two study and uh, should obtain a clinical proof of concept of our lead antibody again uh, still this year. And we then plan to roll out the, the use of this antibody in a phase three, so doing the classical way of, of antibody development, but just being extremely fast or as fast as possible. Um, if you can now go to the last of my slides, I will just summarize the situation we are now. So we got more than 100 people volunteered from which we selected the based on their clinical records, the most promising uh, candidates. We have derived antibody libraries from 18 of, of these. And we have now screened uh, more than 2.5 millions of B cells that come from these patients. And we plan to have at the end three development candidates. At the moment, we have still uh, we, have, we have a candidate, uh, 10 um, neutralizing antibodies in the picomolar range, and we still think that until next week we will get more antibodies, and from these we will identify three so-called development candidates that we will then uh, transfer to the CDMO for the fast drug production, and then we will start phase one at the same time. Um, where, while this is going, we also clarify the regulatory path. We had also, also our, our first um, regulatory scientific advice meeting, which went quite well. So the fast track production was accepted. So it's not something that I, I'm amazed that now with the regulators, many things are possible that would not have been possible before because we had done the same thing with our BKV 
polyoma virus antibody and there we are still going this dreadful 16 month production scheme until we have a, a phase one production. And I think it's, it's really great to see that also the regulators can move and uh, that's really good. And at the same time, we're also now in contact or we are talking, we have a memorandum of understanding with the first pharma company who would be interested in helping us uh, getting this also to the patient pretty soon. And with this, I want to close and hand it over yeah. to you, Rao. <laughs> Thank you, Christoph. And uh, we move to now Dr. Ella Kolhoff, speaking about immunity. Yes. Hello. Okay, you, you can go directly to slide three, please. <laughs> slide three. <laughs> yes, thank you. So this is a, that was just the forward looking statements I had to show that was very quick. So it's about the development pipeline and it's about IMU-83. So Immunic has currently three projects in development and we develop oral drugs in autoimmune diseases and chronic inflammatory diseases. And finally, actually to our own surprise in uh, COVID-19 as well. So the lead asset is IMU-83, and it is currently in four phase two trials. And then we have Rogamat and Rogamat inverse agonist, IMU-935, it's in phase one. And with IMU-856, we will start phase one pretty soon. So coming to IMU-83, this is a DHODH inhibitor. So it means that it selectively targets cells with a high metabolically tu metabolic turnover. Um, we are currently testing IMEA trade in multiple sclerosis, and uh, we are close to finalizing phase two. And as you can see here with the orange diamond, that we will receive top line data from the phase two trial uh, in relapse remitting multiple sclerosis uh, very soon, so in the first half of August of this year. So, um, yes. And then we have two more phase two clinical trials ongoing. One is in ulcerative colitis and the other one in PSC. It's an orphan liver autoimmune disease. And now coming to COVID-19. So for COVID-19, we have an ongoing phase two trial with roughly 200 patients. And this and their IMUH rate is given on top of standard of care. It's a placebo controlled randomized trial in COVID-19 patients with moderate to severe disease and those patients have clinical symptoms. So it's in the stage of WHO stage of three to four. And this means that these patients are hospitalized, uh, but they do not need invasive ventilation yet. Uh, the primary endpoint is the proportion of patients without any need for invasive ventilation. And the key secondary endpoint is the duration of ICU treatment and the 28 day all cause mortality rate. Then we have, of course, clinical improvement, duration of hospitalization, and a lot of biomarkers. And we take two swabs uh, from each patient per day over 14 days to see if we have a reduction in the viral load as well. So next slide, please. And why do we think that IMU838 might be effective in uh, COVID-19 patients? So actually IMU838 is a DHODH inhibitor and it blocks the de novo pyrimidine synthesis, what is only needed in metabolically activated cells. And those cells can be, for example, virus infected cells. And it has been shown for DHODH inhibitors in general that they have a broad antiviral activity. And of course, from our own data, we know that we inhibit uh, virus replication with IMU838 uh, for HIV, CMV, HCV, Lassa fever virus, and some more virus types. And in cellular testings, we have demonstrated that we see efficacy against SARS-CoV-2 replication, and that was performed in different cell systems. And with efficacy rates, so with EC90 values, which are well below the IMU-8 rate exposure in patients. Um, IMU-8 rate is an oral drug, and it has an attractive pharmacokinetic safety and tolerability profile. And we have treated already more than 650 individuals. So we can go directly into a phase two trial here. And with regard to the mode of action, I would say that's very interesting because with amio 8 we have a triple attack against um, COVID-19 disease. And first of all, we see an inhibition of the virus replication, and this is due to the depletion of the nucleotide pool. And that means that there are not enough nucleotides 
uh, in the cell to produce the mRNA for virus proteins and the genomic um, virus RNA. Secondly, um, it is known that in the beginning of the infection with SARS-CoV-2, the induction of the innate immune response by interferon signaling is hampered by the virus because it encodes its own um, interferon antagonist. And it is known from literature that the HODH inhibition leads to the induction of innate immune response. And this is independent or can be independent of this interferon signaling. So the third pillar of attack is that in severe cases, it is known that the immune response is overshooting sometimes. And we have this kind of so-called cytokine storm here. With amyloid rate, um, we have a selective inhibition of this overshooting or overreacting immune cells because these cytokines, um, these cytokine high producing cells are especially sensitive towards DHODH inhibition. And last but not least, the inhibition of DHODH is a host cell based antiviral mechanism. And therefore, this is independent of specific viral proteins or mutations. And it offers a broad spectrum antiviral activity for future pandemics. Even so, we hope that we will never have to cope again with this. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kolha. So we'll continue with um, Dr. Akil Jackson. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Akil Jackson, Medical Director at Bergen Bio, and I'm going to present to you some of our work on bemcentinib, which is a selective axyl kinase inhibitor. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. So Bergen Bio are in phase two development of bemcentinib, which is a potent oral highly selective axyl inhibitor, uh, first in its class. And we've uh, progressed to phase two, uh, in second line AML indications and second line non-small cell lung cancer indications, but also have a broad portfolio of investigator-led studies investigating other solid organ and uh, myelogenous uh, leukemias. Uh, it has nanomolar in vitro potency when tested against SARS-CoV-2 with an IC50 of around 150 nanomolars. Uh, it's uniquely selective for Axel, uh, and in the three TAM receptors, so Tyro3 and Mer, which are also uh, members of the same group, uh, Axel is 50 to 100 fold more selective for Axel than these other TAM kinases. Uh, it's available orally, uh, bioavailable orally, and uh, pharmacokinetics facilitates uh, once daily dosing. And in the 200 patients, 80 patient plus who have been studied so far, some over two years. It has a safety and tolerability profile that is uh, suitable for use in frail patients and also potentially supports the combination with other drugs. And particularly when we're investigating it for aggressive cancers, its mechanism of action may be synergistic with other therapies and thus enhancing their response. Next slide, please. So just going to take you through the mechanism that we feel that, that we hypothesize that uh, Axel is uh, having its effect uh, that's been proven in in vitro cell lines. Uh, this apoptotic mimicry is a means by which the virus may get gain entry to cells other than through the spike protein. And it's common to a lot of enveloped viruses. So it's been seen in Zika, it's been seen in Dengue, and uh, it was actually, Bemcentin was first tested in 2014 during the period of the uh, Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And uh, it was selected from a rational uh, plausibility screen by Public Health England's Biosafe uh, Laboratories to test amongst 18 agents uh, for their use against Ebola. Of those 18, it wasn't one of three that uh, made it through to the final stage of testing in vivo. And of those three, it was one of the only two to show that it had a protective effect against the lethal Ebola infection in those animal models. And the means by which uh, Axel works is that uh, Axel sits in the cell membrane. It has an intracellular kinase domain, and it sits as a pair of uh, proteins which uh, cross link to two GAS6 molecules. So GAS6 is a ligand for Axel. It also is a ligand for the other members of the tyro, uh, TAM family, Tyro3 and Mer. 
and it's the tail of the gas six that sits. Uh, it has a uh, series of glut glutamic acid residues, which are carboxylated in a vitamin K dependent fashion. And it's those residues that are able to interact with phosphatidylserine, which is usually located in healthy cells on the inner leaflet, inner membrane of the uh, cell, uh, cell membrane. Uh, it, in apoptotic uh, cells, uh, there are a series of scramblazes and flippases that externalize this phosphatidylserine and it serves as an eat me signal. And so this uh, binding of the gas six tail to phosphatidylserine uh, initiates the process of epherocytosis, so macrophage eating of uh, dying cells. Also, it happens with uh, virally infected cells. So you see that this uh, phosphatidylserine is externalized. By, by definition, those viruses that bleb off contain externalized phosphatidylserine in their envelope coat. And it's this that allows them to gain entry to cells that uh, express axle. And once internalized and uh, uncoated, they're able to continue with vi viral replication. So the second aspect of it is that the uh, axle controls a series of uh, downstream kinases uh, involved with survival, proliferation, uh, and invasiveness. And it's implicated in epithelial to mesenchymal transition which is, and plasticity, which is a part of the reasoning behind its uh, therapeutic uh, intervention in cancers and fibrotic inflammatory diseases. There's an aspect of this where it is able to heterodimerize with the interferon A receptor and uh, by stimulating that jack stout pathway leads to suppression of cytosine signaling through SOTS1 and 3. So as well as entering the cell via axle, once that cell is entered, the innate interferon uh, defense mechanisms are down-regulated quite successfully. And we know that this is the case in SARS-CoV-2 it's perhaps even more sensitive to interferon uh, suppression than SARS, the original SARS-CoV. So uh, knockout animals that uh, lack um, axle are resistant to uh, SARS in this, in this way, uh, and lr envelope viruses, and bemcentinib is able to, uh, in the models that we've tested it, have a significant uh, potent inhibition of SARS-CoV-2 infection of cells by this dual mechanism of preventing entry and also relieving the uh, suppressive effect of uh, interferon signaling. Next slide, please. So the Accord II platform is the uh, means by which we are studying this uh, bemcentinib in COVID-19. So the UK government have a series of platform studies. You'll have heard of recovery, which uh, was able to show the effect and utility of dexamethasone as a phase three agent. Accord two is looking at agents which are uh, in development, but not yet licensed. So in phase two and repurposing them uh, in this uh, seamless uh, adaptive platform uh, where they're compared against a, a standard of care control arm. Uh, as agents are brought into the platform, they are added and there's a randomization across the groups. And there's a two-stage design. So firstly, in a comparison of 60 per arm, uh, each agent against the standard of care, the primary endpoint is looking at a, uh, using the WHO ordinal scale, which runs from zero to in uninfected to eight uh, with patients who have died. It's looking to enroll patients in uh, categories three, four, and five. So hospitalized patients, either not requiring oxygen or requiring oxygen without uh, invasive ventilation and looking in the primary endpoints to see whether there's a sustained uh, reduction by two, scale, two steps on that scale uh, or uh, discharge from hospital, whichever is the uh, first. So it's been conducted in 10 NH sites across the UK. The dosing is the same as the recommended phase two dose that we're studying in oncology and it will be given for up to 15 days duration or until the patients are discharged. Uh, after that phase, first phase, there will be a potential to move on, if there is compelling data, to a second phase confirmatory arm of 125 patients, again, compared to standard of care. And following that, there's the opportunity to 
move all move agents that look very promising into a, a phase three. So the recovery trial is still ongoing, and that is where the phase three uh, studies will go. Next slide, please. So to sum up, we have a good uh, body of mechanistic and preclinical research supporting the rationale to treat COVID. Uh, this is accumulating, and Wendy Murray, our collaborator at the University of Iowa, is uh, shortly going to be publishing data on that. We'll be able, through this platform, to get an early indication of whether the, these potential drug treatments, including bencentinib, are able to improve the outcomes in the most vulnerable patients with COVID, nine hospitalized patients. And we'll get a top-line readout of the data over the ensuing months. So once we know whether the results are positive or not, we can advance rapidly to a phase three trial across the UK. And that's it. Thank you very much for your time. Hey, thank you, Akhil. And uh, we now move on to Gilead Rade from Red Hill Bio. Thank you uh, very much for inviting Red Hill Biopharma to participate on this exciting panel about potential therapeutics against COVID-19. Next slide, please. So this is just the standard uh, disclaimer of uh, statements. And next slide, please. Uh, okay, this slide, sorry. Uh, Red Hill Biopharma is uh, a fast growing specialty pharmaceutical company and we're focused on commercialization and development of drugs for GI diseases and anti-infectives. Uh, we are currently promoting three commercial products in the US with a sales force of over 100 reps. And uh, these products are Tadesia for Helicobacter pylori infection, which was fully developed by Red Hill in-house uh, and launched in March of this year. Movantic for opioid induced constipation, which was recently acquired from AstraZeneca and generated approximately $100 million in sales last year. And then Colo for Traveler's Diarrhea, which was licensed from Cosmo Pharmaceuticals, a strategic partner of ours. So we have a broad and advanced clinical pipeline, and I'll only mention RHB204 uh, for treatment of non-tuberculous mycobacteria, which is going into a pivotal phase three study later this quarter. And of course, the topic of this panel, we are rapidly advancing two novel molecules into phase two or three studies for treating COVID-19 patients. Next slide, please. The uh, leading program, Opaganib, is a unique and novel orally administered selective sphingosine kinase inhibitor. It has potent anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory and antiviral activity. Uh, so uh, well positioned for COVID-19 uh, activity. Importantly, compassionate use uh, has demonstrated already substantial benefit to severe COVID-19 patients that were treated with opaganib as compared to a matched control case, case controls from the same hospital in which they were treated. And a little bit of the data that came out of that showed that uh, all the opaganib treated patients were discharged from hospital or room air without requiring mechanical ventilation. And these were severe patients uh, on uh, supplemental oxygenation. Uh, this is uh, as compared to 33% of the matched case control group. Uh, also, the median time to the weaning from oxygen supplementation was reduced uh, to 10 days from 15 days in the control group. And this is uh, as good as or better than what has been reported for remdesivir, uh, that is the only currently uh, emergency use approved uh, antiviral, uh, which is given IV. Um, also, in terms of some markers, we saw that there was a significantly uh, significant increase in lymphocyte counts versus controls. And this is an indicator that uh, patients were improving faster from the viral infection uh, with treatment of opaganib as, com as compared to the controls. And we also saw a decrease in CRP, which is a standard <coughs> marker. So uh, this all supports the benefit to these patients. Based on this uh, promising outcomes, and potential, we are pursuing a rigorous clinical plan, which consists of a phase two study uh, in the US, a randomized phase two study in up to 40 patients, which is already recruiting. And in parallel to that, we are uh, pursuing a uh, multinational randomized phase two, three in up to 270 patients. And this has been uh, already approved by UK's MHRA. And we expect other countries uh, in which we have submitted to follow shortly. And we plan initiation uh, for this phase two, three study in this month of July. So 
if all goes well, the data that we can uh, provide clinically could potentially support emergency use authorization of Paganib in uh, as early as Q4 of this, uh, of this year. So we're already preparing for potential ramp up of manufacturing and uh, to commercial scale in the hope of uh, helping as many COVID-19 patients in need as possible globally. Next slide, please. The uh, second program, which is a novel orally available candidate, is Upamostat. This is a serine protease inhibitor. Uh, and uh, Upamostat's mechanism of action includes direct antiviral activity by interfering with the cleaving of uh, the viral surface protein that enables the attachment of the virus to the host cells. And also uh, potential inhibition of pulmonary damage, which is caused by the viral induction of trypsins and potentially other proteins. So we are planning to initiate a phase two, three study in mild to moderate COVID-19 patients, which are outpatients, so not hospitalized. This is a uh, underserved infected population. And most of the studies are being focused on the more severe hospitalized patients. And with these two promising programs, we are uh, positioned to potentially help COVID-19 patients at all stages of disease severity in the hospitals and in the outpatient setting. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah. thank, you. Thank, thank you, Gilead. And uh, I think uh, we have reached 45 minutes. We still have around 15 minutes, but I think uh, we'll continue with Q&A. Uh, we, we have time, I think we'll manage. Thomas, I understand you will stop the clock at 60 minutes. Okay, very good. Okay, so I'll start with the first questioning and then uh, Vincent will continue and we alternate. Uh, I just want to start with uh, Dr. Penninger first. So Joseph, um, as you mentioned that about, uh, you showed that S2 is a viral entry point long time ago and you even developed a soluble S2 molecule. And my questions to you is why this wasn't pursued in the SARS and MERS? And what are the challenges that you are facing today to you know, take this molecule much more effectively into the clinic? Uh, yes, well, SARS, after, SARS already had disappeared after we, when we developed it. So the interest disappeared totally on this. Uh, secondly, MERS uses a different receptor called DPP4. Probably it's very similar downstream mechanism, so it could work actually there. <clears throat> and the, and one of the major obstacles for fast development is, uh, to be honest, I think the WHO is doing a really crappy job to promote actually medicines which we think actually not working very well. And it's very difficult for small companies who especially don't have the power and the connections to actually uh, run fast clinical trials. <clears throat> so I think actually what's happening at the moment is a gold rush from lots of uh, drugs. Everybody's trying to push them, uh, many unproven <clears throat> into clinical studies and actually, you know, drugs which make a lot of sense have a hard time to actually get recruitment. So, <clears throat> so I'm actually not really pleased what's happening with the gold rush at the moment. Okay. Are you saying that we will never see SARS in itself, in our lifetime again, when you say SARS has disappeared from the planet? Uh, there are at least 20 other viruses which can use ACE2 as a receptor. So there might be others which jump to humans. Okay. So, but Good. Not... And you briefly mentioned about uh, the completely novel targets that other people are not looking at today, looking purely from a biology point of view, the virus and the cell. Uh, what, uh, could you please share us your thoughts from that perspective? So I, again, like, you have a novel approaches to coronavirus inhibition. Oh, yeah, so we basically uh, developed ways to engineer cells and genome. So we basically can find the single fish in the entire ocean, and not just the single fish in the entire ocean. We can tell you which scale on the fish is important for a pathway. So it's a single amino acid resolution whole genome screening to find weak spots for the viruses. We do this together with some of 
virology places in Europe, which have actually the live viruses like Ebola, swine flu, <clears throat> many coronaviruses. And by doing so, we actually want to find the weak spots in cells because the virus cannot wiggle out, out of these ancient machineries. Uh, the virus needs to replicate and grow. But nobody could really find them because this ancient machinery is actually essential for the cells. <clears throat> so, but it's basically, you know, if I'm responsible for the virus infection, <clears throat> I can tell you my little finger is responsible. And because of this, we can make totally new targeted therapies against them. So that's what we're doing. And we'll be, I just got the press release, will be announced shortly. That we... Okay. Thank you for the surprise, Joseph. So we'll look forward to it. Okay, Vincent, please continue. You've been just sitting quiet naturally for a good reason. So, yeah. So, uh, hi, everyone. So, Chris, a question to you. There are many companies active in uh, developing antibodies interfering with the infection of the virus. And so, the first question is you know, who will succeed and what do you think are the criteria? I think there will be a couple of players who will succeed. I think the criteria, the chief criteria will probably be a mixture of speed and quality of the of of the treatment that you can achieve with your antibodies. You need a highly active antibody, but at, in the end, it will also be a market penetration. So also the, the machinery has to be in place to bring this really to the markets. And I think for the time being, it's also a productivity issue. So all these Many of the trials, they were done with uh, transiently transfected material. I think that some of the antibodies cannot be produced in the amounts that will be required um, to fulfill the need of the markets uh, that are now, because you have now 60,000 new cases in the US every day. Um, I think this, this will suck up the, the, the capacity of Regeneron completely. Uh, the US has already reserved for half a Billion, I think, uh, all of uh, Regeneron's early material. So I think there's space for new players. We are not among the first that is uh, that we know, but I think we are quite fast uh, in the second wave, and we have we reckon that we have good chances to also get to the market and then show with our product that we can really make a difference in the treatment of patients. Very very insightful. Uh, another question is. Some companies like, like Regeneron go with more than one antibody, so sort of cocktails mm -hmm. or two antibodies or more. Some others go with a single highly potent one. Mm -hmm. What are the pros and cons? Uh, yes, I think the pros with Regeneron's uh, cocktail approach is it's certainly the probability that a, a virus escape mutant is also is captured then by a second antibody is higher. Although they couldn't show this, for example, with their Ebola cocktail, which is as good as a monoclonal antibody, um, I think, but also on the same side, the downside of a cocktail approach is you have more chances for toxicity, you have more chances for a, a hiccup in the production so there's always also risk associated with this, but from an immunologic, immunological point of view, I think a cocktail is always better. Uh, we ourselves, we aim for a monoclonal approach, uh, but also reserve the possibility to, to have a cocktail because we have so many antibodies with different mechanisms of action. So I think that it's prudent enough to say we go for monoclonal, but we are able to quickly switch on to a cocktail approach as well. Okay, and, and quickly, last question. Uh, how much uh, re-engineering your approach of antibody discovery needs to get the antibody to the, to the bedside, to the patients? Okay, our philosophy is what is helping in, in the donor uh, person who survived or recovered from COVID, we do not need to change. So we use no engineering. We, we uh, use a straightforward IgG1 antibody as it occurred in the patient or in the donor. Okay, great. So no thank you very much. Uh, thank you, okay. Christoph. Back okay. to you, Raoul. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Slinger. I have a quick question while we're on the topic. How long do you think the um, this antibody response will protect us? One year, two years, 10 years? No, certainly not. It will protect us maybe for three to four, five, six, two months, maybe. 
So it's not a it's not like a vaccine. It's more for people at risk that get infected or have uh, have been exposed exposed to a infected person. So I think it's really a therapy and not a protective measure that you would give to anybody on the street. It's also too expensive, I think. So they can be subsequently infected up to six months. Depending on the on the potency of the antibody and the uh, the way how the reinfection happens, yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. So I'll continue with uh, Dr. Hella Kolhoff. Uh, hi, uh, with the DHO the inhibitor, uh, I have some memory of this working long time ago as an immune suppressive drug potentially having worked for Navani. So I was wondering, looking at the data, I mean. It is similar to dexamethasone. At the same time, it could be inhibiting somewhat different pathways. Maybe it's much more specific to dexamethasone. My question to you is in terms of coming to the market, what challenges do you face considering this? your endpoints are very similar to either dexamethasone or remdesivir? Oh, so, so first of all, I think there's a huge difference uh, of IMUH rate compared to dexamethasone because DHODH DH only targets high metabolic turnover cells. So it's very selective to those overshooting immune responses. And of course, directly uh, on the antiviral or on the, the viral replication. So it, with a triple attack, it, it is a completely different mechanism. And the, the impact on the immune system, so dampening the overshooting immune response and triggering a bit of the innate immune response, uh, it is very specific. So, and, uh, but, we are currently testing if it's successful and if it has an, an impact on, on COVID-19 patients. So uh, with regard to the, well, the commercial question, it's, well, it is a, it's a small molecule. It's an oral drug, easy to use. Uh, small molecules in, in general are um, more or less easy to, to, to uh, synthesize. So this is just a three-step synthesis. So it's relatively easy here. And uh, to my mind, um, oral drugs can be commercially very attractive compared, for example, to biologics, and they are easy to use. So my, following up on this, are you, because of the differences in the mechanism itself, um, is there an effort to combine it as a combo therapy? Because in HIV, combo therapy in the end has been very, very successful. Mm -hmm. So are there efforts from your side to combine with other molecules? Yeah, so actually, first of all, we are doing a monotherapy to understand mm -hmm. the, uh, the effect size and really the, the mode of action and what we see. But it is, it is known from, from preclinical assays that was performed in uh, influenza H1, um, H1N1 that was from an animal model where they showed that if you just use tummy flu, you have an impact on the influenza um, infection but in later stages, it's no longer helpful. But if you combine it with a DHODH inhibitor, at least in those animals mo models, you have this 100% survival of the animals. So yes, in principle, I think it will be a good idea to combine with, for example, direct antiviral therapies, for example, with remdesivir. Or maybe in those patients uh, in the later stage, in those severe infected patients, might be helpful to combine with dexamethasone. The interesting thing is that uh, since in our clinical trial, we have the, um, we add IMUH rate on top of standard of care, we will have some of the combinations by nature and we might get a hint. It's not uh, randomized for this and we don't have a statistical endpoint for the, co for the different combinations that can arise, but we will get some information on good combinations. I'm fascinated to hear the standard of care um, again and again in this discussion. Yeah, <laughs> I think most of the people are they referring to the supplementation with oxygen and ventilation, or are they referring to other drugs? Yeah, so actually, some of the patients will only get oxygen, and yeah. others, for example, will get remdesivir, and others will get I don't know. So we we will see what they really get. The only thing we excluded from our clinical trial is uh, the use of hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, Vincent, back to you. Sorry, I was on mute. Oh, sorry, okay. Yeah, so the question now is for Akil. And uh, 
So the, the first one is, the, the, do you think there are other kinase inhibitors or inhibitors directed towards other kinases that would be also well suited to, to go after this virus? And I'm sure you're aware that there has been a high impact uh, a paper coming out in a high impact uh, factor journal published mm -hmm. a few days ago describing the, the changes in the phosphoproteome upon uh, SARS. Uh, or cov to infection. So do, do you think actually it's kind of unique or do you think there are many nodes and pathways involving kinases which can use to combat the virus? I, mean, I presume you're referring to the Buhadi paper from Cell. Yeah, uh, indeed. Yeah, so I mean, it's a very good question. Uh, the easy answer would be to say that our company is focused on Axel alone, but you know, clearly, you know, I've talked about... Uh, one enzymatic target, you know, involved in the JAK stat pathway, and it would seem an obvious thing to, you know, say, well, perhaps JAK inhibitors might be. And certainly, we've seen publications, uh, you know, at the very start of this uh, epidemic, where AI-based approaches were suggesting that potentially JAK inhibitors might be worth trying. I think it always comes back down to, well, the theoretical and what's seen in cell lines and what you can actually do in a population that is not, you know, a lot of these drugs are in you know, oncology indications. So, you know, you could look at ruxolitimib or there's JAK inhibitors in uh, a range of rheumatological mutations. And the, it's a benefit risk way up. Yeah, you, you know, the tolerability and the safety profile, it needs to be matched against. Clearly in a disease where the outcomes are so drastic and, uh, mortality rates are high, particularly in uh, uh, hospitalized patients, that benefit risk equation is shifted because of the, uh, the, the, the challenges of the disease itself. But it still is one that uh, the regulators will scrutinize. And it will be, it's, uh, you know, the paper identified Axel as being one of uh, mm -hmm. the targets. Uh, there was also, you know, casein kinase, which is in, uh, involved in, you know, cell motility and the ability of a cell to stick out to the podium it's it so there are and i think overall of the 500 odd kind of human kinases they identified 97 that could play a role and i think yes there are messages around that pathway but uh you need to understand what that message is saying in in the context of the disease and so there's a spatial and a temporal aspect to it why we feel that Axel is a uh, particularly uh, valid target is one, it's kind of a redundant, uh, in, in health, it's redundant. It, you know, you, you can do without it. Uh, animals can be bred with knockout and have no significant impacts. Uh, you know, it's inducible. So it's induced in these situations of stress, situations of inflammation, and it's present at the target organ side. And it is possibly, you know, when we're looking at the vulnerability that uh, is represented by those patients who do worst with SARS-CoV-2, we know that they already are likely to have higher expression of Axel in those organs that are affected. So we've been looking at Axel, and it's been well published for a long time in, you know, liver disease, in, you know, progressive kidney disease. And you can see the stepwise progression of Axel expression, both in IHC and in that cleaved soluble axle uh, when the ecto domain is shed into the circulation, showing that there is a clear link between these chronic fibroinflammatory conditions and axle expression. If that is the case, then axle as a target in those patients who are most vulnerable may well have a beneficial effect, particularly in those who are at their most vulnerable. Great. Okay. Vincent, Thank I'll you. quickly take, uh, ask one question to Gilead as the time seems to be running out. Uh, Gilead, I have two quick questions for you. One, your restaurant regulation sounds exciting. How do you think it is uh, working, in your opinion? You briefly mentioned that uh, S1P is everywhere. And the second thing is the protease inhibitors. How do you see the path forward because some of the protease inhibitors did not work so well? Sure. So in terms of the uh, sphingosine kinase inhibition, yeah. uh, it's a selected sphingosine kinase 2 inhibitor. And sphingosine kinase 2 is thought to be part of the complex uh, of the cellular replication transcription complex that the virus uses in order to uh, multiply in the cell. Right. Uh, 
inhibiting SK2 specifically interferes with this replication process of positive single-stranded RNA viruses like the coronavirus. So that could be a direct antiviral activity. And in fact, on the host cell mechanisms, it is possibly uh, prone less to a resistance emergence by viral mutations. So that's also a potential advantage. Uh, in terms of the uh, serine protease inhibition, Upamistat is inhibiting serine proteases, which are the host serine proteases. Uh, other, other, other protease inhibition, inhibitors like Caletra that have seemed to not work very well are inhibitors of other classes of proteases, the viral HIV proteases. So they're not related, they're not the same type of, um, of the proteases that are being uh, targeted. And that's where we see the potential for Upamostat to actually uh, act on the, um, on the proteases that are essential for the viral entry into the cell by its attachment to, uh, to the cell receptors. Okay, thank you, Gilead. Vincent, back to you. Yeah, so that time is running, so I will just uh, very quickly wrap up. Uh, I think what, what is amazing is that uh, within five speakers, we, we have seen such a, a great diversity of approaches, biological, small molecules, different pathways, some uh, drugs tackling more than one, one, one pathways, and you know, not even talking about vaccines here. So of course, there are many unknowns, you know, mutations, uh, new wave, epidemiology, and so forth. But what is clear that science has never been so, so fast. I mean, we have a huge sequencing power, single cell genomics, spatial genomics, you know, all of that, virtually free computing power through the cloud. And you know, last but not least, an unprecedented way to collaborate at the scientific level. Tons of money coming from government, you know, super, super government agencies, the private sector as well. So all of that coalesces in, in science that has never been so fast. And uh, you know, same for the regulatory side. So I think we can really be hopeful. That's the you know, last phrase. Uh, the pace at which we, we, we see progresses, the number of new drugs, be, be they repurposed or, or novel being tested, the vaccines coming along, and that's... Uh, no, that, 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 that's a, a great hope, I think, for, for, for all of us. And we will learn a lot for, for the next pandemics because, you know, that's you know, obvious. There, there will be more pandemics for, for more viruses, and we will have developed tools to, 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 to tackle that, generic tools. Thank you for all the, to, to all the speakers and the attenders. It's been great to, to be online. Mm -hmm.